the Abuse History presents the United States History production of Constitutional Checks and Balances. And introducing the facilitator of your learning experience, Mr. Hughes. Oh yeah! Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. In the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to take a look at the uh, issue checks and balances. Not really an issue, really a theme in constitutional foundations. And uh, we're going to get to the nitty gritty. We're really not going into too much detail. This lecture is really designed for maybe a high school student or a, maybe if you're like in an intro class to U.S. history or government and you're like, I better know something, this might be the lecture for you. So what we're going to do in four sections is we're going to discuss basic philosophy and foundations of checks and balances, which is really interlaced with separation of powers. And then we'll take a look at all three branches and go through, uh, you know, the content that you need in terms of the vocab and uh, checks and balances, but really give you some historical circumstances, because that's really what the essay is going to be about, not just you muttering out, you know, impeachment, ah, but really giving a fluid example where you understand, uh, uh, we understand that you understand, that I understand, that let me get started. So, uh, let's do that, all right? I'm going to walk off camera and walk on before you can say, um, Betty Bocker. Constitutional Foundations. All right, foundations, right? Get to it, Hughes. Foundations come out of the European Enlightenment. Two names that you're going to need to know are John Locke. Remember, Locke, open the door to your rights, natural rights. And Montesquieu, the French philosopher that wrote more about um, separation of powers, about you know, checks and balances and having different forces in government so no one force could dominate. Um, but really, those two both are about limiting government, right? That the most important thing in this world is your natural rights, private property maybe back then, but natural rights today in terms of your freedom, right? And that government is really here to protect that, um, as opposed to like a Thomas Hobbes, I can't do lethethin, man, that's crazy. All right, so out of that enlightenment, we get to the Declaration, right? We leave England, we adopt the Articles of Confederation, that kind of sucked and didn't work out. The feds were too weak. Remember O'Shea's Rebellion, good for us. We march on into uh, Philadelphia, 1887, and damn it, we're going to do it again. So we throw out the articles and we start anew. And now, while the theme at the Constitutional Convention is strength, in a sense, and especially you know in the early administrations of Washington and Adams, um, we're really going to beef up the Constitution. And the Constitution has some pretty powerful beef in there, some pretty you know big mojo. Uh, the Supremacy Clause, and, you know, don't mess with me, bro. The Elastic Clause, you know, the flexibility of Congress having the ability to make all laws necessary and proper. The Amendment Procedure, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, implied powers. There's just tons of stuff in state commerce uh, that really gives it power. So um, our theme is limiting that power, right? What in the Constitution limits the power of the federal government? And the number one answer is checks and balances. So there's your thesis. Checks and balances is a mechanism to limit the power of the federal government to avoid abuses and bad mistakes, right? To slow it down. Change is slow in the United States. And checks and balances, um, and that separation of power concept, is pretty much why. It's kind of like, you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to stick a rock through a straw sometimes, getting, getting a law passed or, you know, doing something with public policy. But the founders and the Constitution itself, I guess they wanted it that way, to make sure that we were really slow and steady about the way that we did things. So here we go, right? We come out of the convention and we have three branches of government, um, and we're ready to go into each one. So I'm going to go pick it up right there next to me and pick it up and do it with you. Let's first take a look at the legislative branch, and then we got to look at legislative and how it interacts with the other two branches, and even with itself. That's crazy. The legislative branch checks. Legislative branch. So let's really quick look at how Congress checks first the president and then how Congress checks the judicial branch and how they check themselves. Yeah. So, number one, Congress versus the president. Ding, ding, ding. Now, Congress, it's a little harder to talk about because you have the House and the Senate. So, be careful as you're listening here. I might say House, I might Senate, I might say both, or Congress itself. So, you know, just some of the nitty-gritty details, you might find that helpful. Number one, impeachment power, right? They can throw the bum out. And impeachment power, just like I was mentioning before, is broken up. 
So first, the House of Representation, I always see kind of them like Inspector Gadget, you know, kind of like... Da -da 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 -da. They investigate the president in order to find out whether they're going to impeach them or, you know, they think there's something going on. So not only is it investigative power, but it's the formal power of impeachment. Impeachment takes a simple majority in the House, 51%, and then that president is in trouble. Um, it's a two-step process, though, so hold your horses, right? Um, two presidents, here's your historical example, have been impeached. Andrew Johnson was impeached after the Civil War for basically violating the Tenure of Office Act or really having you know, opposing views of the, the radical Republicans, but we can't get into that. And Bill Clinton got impeached for lying to Congress under oath um, for stuff that makes me feel uncomfortable as a social studies teacher uh, talking to you about. But nevertheless, neither of them were removed because impeachment is a two-step process. So both of them went to the Senate, and here's where the check comes in, so we're not just crazy throwing out presidents for doing stupid stuff, but really bad, bad stuff. Um... And that's two-thirds Senate trial. The Senate holds the trial, but you need two-thirds vote to kick the person out. And nobody has ever been kicked out. It was close. Andrew Johnson, one vote. Wow. But that's impeachment and removal. So that would be the House, right, on the president. I use the analogy of the mad dog. The mad dog bites the president with its sharp teeth. But that might just be confusing some of you right about now. Other powers. Definitely overriding veto, right? Congress makes laws. We know that, right? I'm just a bill, I'm only a bill, I'm up there on Capitol Hill. Nevertheless, once that bill goes through both houses, it goes to the president, and the president can veto it. But here's where it gets a little nitty-gritty, yo. It goes back to Congress, and if you can get a two-thirds um, vote to override the veto, that piece of legislation becomes law. So, that's a check on the president, right? If the president's just being stupid, and he's like, oh, I'm going to veto everything, dirk, 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 dirk. Congress still has power, if it's really a popular law, to go around the president and override that veto. Um, a really kind of detailed one, maybe if you, if you pay attention just for a minute, is actually the Electoral College. Um, you know, we understand the Electoral College really to be kind of whoever wins the Electoral College as president. Um, but the way that it's set up in the Constitution is actually, you know, you have to win a majority of the votes. So, you know, I forget, it's like 538, but it's like a pizza pie, Right? In order to become president, you have to win a little bit more than half of the pie. And since there's always a two of parties eating the pie, uh, somebody always a win. But if you had other political parties, the Constitution says it goes to the House of Representation, that the House would choose the president. Talk about a check, right, on the president. There you go. But nevertheless, um, check and balance, let's just keep going. The president signs treaties, but if he signs a treaty with... Uh, the devil? Is the devil going to be our ally? No, because the treaty goes to the Senate. The Senate's really the big checker on the president when it comes to treaties and nominees. So, historical example time, right? World War I, W.W. W. Woodrow Wilson, right, W.W., w., comes um, to Europe after the war with his 14 points of peace. Sing Kumbaya when you do it, you'll always remember it, right? It's 14 points, my friends, 14 points. Woodrow Wilson's plans of peace. He goes over with the League of Nations. When he comes back, the Senate's going to show him. That didn't rhyme at the end, but I hope you get the idea. Um, after he signed the Treaty of Versailles and had kind of America joining the League of Nations, it's like, whoa, we have to go back to the Senate, and the Senate checks the president on that power. And back then, the Senate rejected the Treaty of Versailles, and the United States fell back into isolationism. Please stand by as we are experiencing technical difficulties. The legislative also checks the president when it comes to Supreme Court nominees. So if the president chooses, you know, I don't know, uh, Darth Vader, Darth Vader's got to march into the Senate and answer some questions before he can get approved and beyond the Supreme Court. The last one that I would like to discuss is the idea of kind of the military. Now, we understand that the president's commander-in-chief, I get it, but he can't do, she can't do whatever they want. So Congress holds the reins in a couple of regards to war. Number one, Congress has the power to declare war. Um, the president can send troops, but if there's not a declared war, you know, they have to come back. That's the War Powers Act of 1973, but nevertheless, they also allocate funds. So, you know, go ahead and use your army men with no money. Good luck on that one, Mr. President. But, you know, that's the idea. Um, so that's legislative on executive. 
Legislative Checks Judicial. All right, guys, this one's a little bit simpler. We're going to do legislative check on judicial. Congress checking the judges. We've already kind of gone over one. The idea that Congress has to approve nominees to the court by the president. That's kind of like a three-ring circus, right? The nominee of the judges. You have both, uh, all branches in there. Um, but also on the judges, and this is probably a better one, they create the judicial branch structure. Um, the Judiciary Act of 1789 set up the federal court system. They can change the number of judges on the Supreme Court. FDR tried with court packing, but that's constitutional. So that means legislative can check you know, the court by changing the size. But my favorite one, and this is the best one, is the idea that, that Congress can initiate an amendment to the Constitution. And if you remember judicial review, judicial review is when the court uses the Constitution right, to check something going on in the game, a law, a presidential action. So if Congress is upset with the results, they can change the rule book. And that's a huge check and balance. So there you go, approving nominees to the court, right? Changing the court size, changing the court structure, and um, big time amending the Constitution. So here we go, we're gonna rapidly move on. All right guys, so I'm gonna walk off and walk back on, and the last legislative check is legislative on legislative. It's like you're punching yourself in the face, right? This is House checking Senate and vice versa. So really quick, step off, step on, and we'll do that. Congress checks itself. It's short and sweet, but man, you want a five and you want to do checks and balances, do that check. Both houses, Senate and right House, have to pass a bill. That's a check and balance, and this goes on all the time. So, for instance, in the news recently, there's a congressman by the name of Paul Ryan who uh, proposed a plan, a long-term plan, that was voted on in the House, which was going to try to solve the debt crisis by trimming like $7 trillion off the debt. And one of the ideas was to basically turn Medicare into a voucher program, where senior citizens in 10 years would uh, basically receive a check where they could go purchase health insurance. Rather than actually receiving health insurance, Republican Party argues that competition, by you having money to go out and compete, will lower costs and it'll be cheaper, right? The Senate will never pass that. If the Senate passes that, I'll pull a monkey out of my ear and throw it at you. Because it's not going to happen. So that's a check and balance. The Senate basically checking the House by saying, we're not going to do it, and vice versa. And the last one would be that all revenue bills have to start in the House. So if the Senate wants to do something, that power is checked by the idea that they can't spend the money. The House has to spend the money. Um, but there you go. There's the last of the legislative checks. So let's start with the executive branch now and look at their influence on the other branches. Be right back. The executive checks the legislative. This is kind of easy, guys. We don't want to make it overcomplicated. The biggest one is veto, baby, right? The president can veto legislation. And, you know, 98% of the time, if you veto legislation, it's done. It's gone. Overriding takes two-thirds. So the pre president holds amazing kind of legislative power, in a sense, or at least the power to stop the legislature branch by vetoing laws. Um, some of the, the, the prime examples, I guess, or one of the bi biggest examples on the test would be Jackson's veto of the National Bank, um, like in 1832 or way back then. Um, he was called the veto king, and sometimes you'll see a cartoon where he has a crown on his head because it was seen as an abuse of power because he vetoed everything. But that's the president's constitutional right. If he doesn't like legislation, he can veto it. Um, he can only propose legislation. He can't pass it, but he can certainly stop it. Um, kind of at a higher level, maybe, some of you might get this. There's actually a court case, I think it's Clinton versus New York City, where um, they started something in the late 90s called the line item veto. And they said that every, you know, it didn't make sense to veto the whole bill. That the president should have the power to veto only specific pieces of a bill. But in a sense, what the court decided was that gave the president too much legislative authority. It was like he was writing the bill, or he got to get a get the final draft with his pen, and that that only could be changed, go back to legislative power, right? If you don't like the court decision, what do you do? Change the Constitution. So checks and balances, right? They're working as I'm talking. Executive checks on the legislature. The vice president's head of the Senate cast, you know, tie votes. That's, I guess, a 
mixing and a check and kind of some interaction there. Um, he can call recess appointments. He can make Congress go back to work in a sense, but that's like me sending you to your room. You know, clean your room. Get up there in two hours. You. Doesn't mean you're going to do it. But nevertheless, I think that's probably good for us. So let's just roll right into it. The executive branch checks the judicial branch. And the big one is they nominate judges. The president nominates judges. So they get to influence the court forever because they serve lifetime appointments. And that's a huge influence and check on the judiciary. They also have pardon power. Pardon power is the kind of get out of jail free card. The president can issue felons or people that are suspects in crimes. The biggest pardon, historical example, would be... Uh, Gerald Ford uh, pardoning Richard Nixon after Watergate, um, basically saying to the judicial branch, don't investigate this guy. We've taken care of it. He's a free bird. So that would be a check on judiciary. Lots of checks and balances. So let me walk off camera, walk back on, and we're going to wrap this up. Judicial branch is next. The judicial branch checks the executive and legislative branch. This is an easy one, right? Judicial review! We're done! Um, and this is actually not in the Constitution itself. Judicial review comes from Marbury versus Madison, one of the first cases heard by the Marshall Court. Um, I can't do the midnight judges. You just need to know that judicial review, the court gave itself that power, is the ability of the court to kind of cipher through presidential actions and laws passed by the government first federal and later state, to see if they're jiving with our Constitution. See the court justices like referees in the NFL or the NHL or roller derby, um, where they're basically making decisions based on game play. So, uh, we'll stick with that analogy for a minute, right? Um, I'm the coach. I'm Congress, right? And I tell America, get out there and ban all abortion. Go do that. Huh, 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 hike. So, the referee is going to blow his whistle and say, wait a minute. Let me check the rules. And he gets out the rules and he makes that decision. Now, that might be too controversial of an example. You can agree or disagree. But they rule that unconstitutional based on the 4th, 9th, and 14th Amendment. But other, other examples would be, um, for instance, uh, we'll go back to Watergate, U.S. versus Nixon. Right, The court making the determination whether or not executive privilege trumped congressional investigation. Um, there's great cases out there, Miranda versus Arizona, or Mapp versus Ohio, Brown versus Board of Education. They can rattle cases off all day. But the idea here is that if Congress passes a law, you know, first it's got to go to the president, and then if it's unconstitutional or someone challenges it in the court system, it's going to face the rogues as well. And that judicial review is a check, so Congress can't just pass laws that are popular, right? It's really a check on the will of the people, if that makes any sense. You know, the idea of democracy is that majority rules. So if we all vote for people that agree with us, and one of our ideas is to kick out people with green eyes, right? Doesn't that mean it's going to happen? It doesn't mean it should happen. The court's going to step in and protect that minority. I don't know if green-eyed people are a minority, probably. But maybe they'll step in and protect the Japanese-American or they'll protect the um, gay American, or they'll protect the immigrant American, or they'll protect the racist American, or, you know, pick your breed here. I mean, it's, it's a mixed lot, and it's not about uh, what's popular. It's about what's in the Constitution. So there's your checks and balances, right? It's like a maze. It's crazy. But you have some examples, whether it's impeachment power with Clinton, right, and nobody going, um, you know, found guilty, um, or it's veto power, or it's treaties and Woodrow Wilson. We don't want to go do it again, Hughes. Just be done, sir. All right. So go study, watch some other lectures, and make sure you understand how checks and balances and separation of powers operates within the United States Constitution. See you later. Where attention goes, energy flows. Don't It's a peddling. Looking out the window, that's a peddling. Staring at my sandals, that's a peddling.
paddling the school canoe? Oh, you better believe that's a paddling. Mm. 